And, you know, that's what God has been speaking to me all week, and that is, is that, that we need to have hope and don't lose it. Tell someone that this morning. Have hope and don't lose it. <laughs> Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You see, there's some people that they think they have faith, but they don't because they're hopeless. You see, faith is the substance of hopeful things. Can you say that? Faith is the substance of hopeful things. If you don't have hope, you can never develop faith. And you want to make it hard to develop faith? Try to develop faith hopelessly. It just doesn't work. There are by the three, faith, hope, and love. They go together. And the greatest of these are love. But I want you to understand that does not make hope less significant because hope is the link that connects faith and love. You have to have hope that God loves you before you'll ever have faith that he loves you. Well, how can we have hope that he loves me? Because he proved it. He sent his only son to be sacrificed to pay for your sins and my sins. Now, that's good reason to hope. But it's not the biggest reason to hope. The biggest reason to hope is not only did he send his son to die and be sacrificed, but he rose him from the dead. Now, if God can raise dead people to life, what is left that's hopeless? And you'll see a major difference in the followers of Christ when he was sacrificed and crucified. They, they scattered. They were hiding. But whenever they found that he had risen from the dead, they turned into ferocious faith creatures. I'm telling you, they weren't afraid, and they weren't hiding anymore, and they were bringing the gospel into the places that they were hiding from, and they were seeing a major change in their life. I want you to understand something, my friend. There's some of us here today, we, we don't realize it, but our hopes have died. Or they're on resuscitation. And, you know, that's what revival is. It means to come back alive. <gasps> and there's some of us here, man, we, we need to come back alive. We don't realize it, but we've, no, we're no longer hoping, we're maintaining. You see, maintenance is where the hopeless hide. You need to write that down for me. That was good. We hide in maintenance. We hide. We try to make it. We were trying to make it big, but now we're just trying to make it. Does that relate to anybody? If you don't have hope, you can never have faith. That's where it starts. You know, there was a guy that stood up before the whole country and changed it. How did he change it? He kept hope alive. His name was Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And he changed his nation forever. And many other nations have been affected by it because he knew the significance of hope and that if things were going to change, there had to be hope for change. Is there hope for change in your marriage? Is there hope for change in your finances? Is there hope for change in your wayward ones, your prodigals? See, sometimes we spend too much focus and time looking on what can't happen instead of looking for where God can make it happen. And, and we get hopeless because we're looking and focusing on the wrong things. My friend, if God can raise from the dead, you know, what, what's your problem that he can't fix? Hope is the beginning of the process of things changing. That's where it starts. There's too many of God's people. They're trying to believe for things they have no hope for. We're not hoping. Hope anticipates something is happening. Hope expects something to happen. Have you lost hope of the things that need to change in your life? Is there anyone besides me there's things I want to change in my life? Are there, are there some here that I'm hoping for things that, that they won't change in your life? Hope, it kind of fits both categories, doesn't it? There's hope for making your marriage improving. Well, how can I do that? Well, you might consider getting some marriage counseling. And then 
How about the, our loved ones who aren't following the Lord? How, how can I have hope for that? Well, maybe doing some things and, and loving them unconditionally yes. and, and, and not preach at them, just love them. Then when they're ready, then preach at them. <laughs> how about financial freedom? Sometimes we go through a difficult time financially. I can remember one of my children saying, Dad, you know, I'm, uh, my husband's lost his job, and, and, and I just lost mine, and we bought a house, and we're not going to make it. And I, well, I said, well, come on, move home, and, 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 and they did, and they lost the house, and that was back in the big housing debacle. And they're living in a beautiful home now. They didn't lose hope. You say, well, I just don't believe in that. Well, how about the year of Jubilee? You believe in that? Yeah. Where all debt is canceled and everybody gets a second chance? That's what that's all about. It's good for the economy, actually. How about your health? Have you ever had a, a health setback? I know um, Tamara's never had anything like that happen, but there's other people that have had that happen, and, and sometimes it looks like you're going to have that fixed, and then you don't, your hopes get dashed, and then it's back to, okay, now what? And, and your hopes can't rest in the circumstances because they change all the time. They have, to, they have to lie in the changer of circumstances. His name is Jesus. How about relationships? I know no one here probably except for Denise and I have some relational conflicts in our family that, um, that, that, that are kind of emphasized during the holidays, you know, during the Christmas time when uncle drink too much comes over, or sister sandpaper, or, you know, and we're <laughs> always rubbing everybody the wrong way, and, you know, there's always somebody that tells things that, jokes they shouldn't tell, and then there's somebody that plays too rough with the kids, you know, that we've got, people are a pain, aren't they? That's why we love them, is because they cause us so much pain. Love suffers long. For some of my, my, my family members, it's like long-suffering. Not just a little long-suffering, you know. How about finding that significant other to share your life with? It's easy to lose hope on that. Well, Pastor, don't you realize a woman that's over 40 years old has an 85% chance of never getting married? Well, don't tell them that. Because they've been getting married here We've got a couple here that neither one of them been married, and they're senior citizens, and they got married. Virgins, senior citizens. And I, and I looked at that, I'm like, anybody can get married in this church. Absolutely, they can find that right person. And I've seen people that have been married before, and they've been through a lot of heartache and pain and tragic circumstances in life, and, and, and now they're remarried, and they're, they're, they're happy, and God's blessing them. And it's so good to see that where there's hope, there can be new life. Where there's hope, there's second chances and third chances and fourth chances. And, you know, maybe, maybe you need to do something significant with your life. And you're at a point in your life where you're thinking, you know, I'm not making that much of a difference, and I'm, I'm really kind of disappointed with where I'm at. Well, take a look at people like Abraham. Abraham was pretty old. I mean, 99 is kind of an old person to be thinking about having a baby. It, it was so challenge, challenging, his wife, who was 20 years younger, laughed her head off. I'm going to have pleasure in my old age. Obviously, she thought it was hilarious, but God had another thing in mind. And so, now we have a faith that was given to us by somebody that believed God for the impossible to make what was dead alive. It's still that whole resurrection idea, whether it's in the physical body or whether it's in the womb or whatever. Whatever is making your heart sick because your hope has been deferred, God wants to change that today. He wants you to know that, that you can believe again. But you have to get your eyes off the circumstances and get them on the Lord. You see... The devil can't stop your faith. Did you know that? But he can stop your hope if you let him. And a lot of times, you know, we're looking to, to fight the devil, you know, fight the good fight of faith, and we're leaving the hope all neglected, and then we wonder why our faith fails is because 
our, our hope failed. That's why he tries to dash all your hopes and dreams before they can actually become the substance of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. No hope, no substance. If I can get you hopeless, I got you. Kind of reminds me of a guy, a guy that had a dream, and in the dream he was in hell, and, and he's looking out through the bars of the door of hell, and, and the devil's laughing and mocking him, and you're never going to get out of here. You're here forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, and the guy just trembling, and he hears this voice behind him, and, and it's kind of undistinguishable, and then it, it starts getting louder and louder, and, uh, and the guy's just absolutely trembling, just t- ap- terrified. And finally, the voice gets loud enough, and the guy turns around, and it's Jesus. And he realizes that the devil is in hell, and he's on the other side of the door, and he's outside of hell looking in through the door. Not looking out of the door, looking into the door. And that's exactly what the enemy wants to do. He wants you to be looking into your hell instead of looking out of it. Look at someone tell me, I'm coming out of this place. That's what hope does. Hope is coming out of where you are into where... God wants you. It's like prophecy. Prophecy is not a prediction of the future. It's an invitation to change it. You're not going to change it without hope. You get some prophetic words, start building hope. Start looking to God to, to, to build your hope if you don't have any to build with. God, you've got plenty of things in the Bible and Scripture. You've done plenty of things to, to make me hopeful. That's why the enemy tries to dash all your hopes and dreams before they can become the substance of faith. And we're tempted by hopelessness, when we have setbacks. Anybody have any setbacks lately? And things happen that you didn't expect to happen? Maybe you had a cancer setback, or maybe you had a heart attack setback. I can remember being in the Philippines, and I just got through doing services all week, and I was just tired, and, and there was a big conflict going on in the church, and we were able to resolve it with all the leaders there, and it was pretty stressful. And at the end, I start feeling nausea. And I start feeling these pains going down my arms. And I, I tell Denise, I can't sit down, I can't stand up, I'm just not comfortable. And Denise said, well, we're going to go to the hospital. And I'm like, in the Philippines? Yeah, no, we need to go to the hospital. And I'm like, well, I'll be all right, just give me a little time here. It's having a heart attack. Look at Steve over here grinning. He knows exactly what I'm talking about. And, and it's like it, it hits you out of nowhere. You have these setbacks, and, and, and you're laying in there. And you, or Actually, when we got to the hospital, you know what they asked me? Do you have a thermometer with you? I'm like, oh, yeah, I just happen to keep one in my back pocket here. You want? And I'm like, oh, boy, where are, we, where are we going now? And it was the doctor's hospital, you know, where they trained the doctors there. They didn't even give me nitro. And I go in there, and I'm there for like eight days in the CCU. And, they, and, and, and I'm so drugged up, I can't ask for Denise to come, and she can only come if I ask her, ask for her to come. And, and so when I got out, they wouldn't let me get on the plane. How many of you know that's kind of hopeless? And, and then finally, we had to stay another week at the hotel for them to let me get on the plane to make sure I was going to be okay. And then I get on the plane, and when I get to the West Coast, they don't want to let me fly to the East Coast because they don't want there to be an emergency and have to interrupt a long flight. And finally, we got them to do that, and we got home, and I'm like, Phew, had another heart attack. <laughs> and I'd had a heart catheter there, and now they got to do another one here. And the doctors tell me, Ron, they didn't give you any nitro. It's a miracle that you don't have heart damage. That's where hope began. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And then... I found out I had a rare condition where you have a spasm in your artery. It's like a Charlie horse in your vein. And it closes up, and then medication makes it loosen up, so I didn't have to have any bypasses. I didn't have to have any stents or anything like that. But I can remember my son was married in May that year, and I can remember going to my in-laws, and they had an outdoor basketball court. And about from here to that exit sign, I took a basketball, and I shot it, and it didn't get halfway there. I was so weak. And I'm like, oh, that, that, that ain't right. Give me that ball. And I shoot it again, harder. 
maybe a little more than halfway. Immediately, I'm like, is this, is this how it's going to be? I've been strong all my life. And I can't even reach the hoop. And you know what? I got depressed. I got discouraged. And I'm like, this thinks. Here I'm at, out doing God's work, and this happens? What in the world's going on? The devil is trying to dash my hopes. And so we went through the cardio rehab and all that, and I got my strength back. And I thank God for that. But you know what? It was a difficult time from there on. There were several years there. It was very discouraging and very depressing. And, and we pressed through, and then we had to make some changes with our ministry. And we went from four churches that had 700 people a weekend down to just two. But that was part of where the stress was coming because we were carrying the others. And then we made some of those changes, and now I come back to where I like ministry. I really love it. And I know I'm doing what God wants me to do. And people, well, they'll say to me, well, Ron, you're too old to be doing all this stuff, getting the flooring in here and doing that building over there. And, you know, what, what are you doing? I said, I'm keeping my hope alive. You see, I'm not too old to do these things. I'm too old when I don't do these things. Your hope does not have an age. You may have less capacity, but there's other resources. Thank God for the eight guys that came over and helped us pack stuff up and, and move it into storage and people that came over and helped us go uh, pick up some things that we needed. And, and, you know, God has a way of providing things that are more than what you have, more resources than you have. We're not getting ready to retire. We're getting scaled down so that we can hope for more things. You know, you don't have as much time as you get older, so now you've got to look at, well, what am I going to put my time into? And I'm not going to put it into anything that's not important. So I'm going to get something smaller, less maintenance, and I'm going to focus on God's people and, and my family and, and the things that really matter in my life. And, yeah, it's a challenge to get that all to happen, but thank God. You know, we sold a house six days on the market, asking price, and didn't have to make any givebacks for the inspection. And so we bought the other place, and, and it's, it's less money. We can pay it off sooner. And we're at a point right now where we're, we're looking, all right, God, we want to go out big time. Look at someone tell them we got more to do. When you get too old for more to do, you've lost your hope. Are you hearing me? You want to stay alive, Bill? Keep hope alive. If you keep hope alive, hope will keep you alive. Amen. Bill Bayless over here. Stand up, Bill. You and your lovely wife, they've been coming here, and, and they're starting a messianic <laughs> service that we're going to be having once a month here at CLC, and we're, we're, we're looking forward to that, you see, and he's been through some challenges where he almost died a bunch of times. I'm going to have him share that in the near future, maybe on a Sunday, and have him preach, and I think it's important for us to realize that this church has got peop hopeless people that found hope. When the doctor tells you to go say what you're going to say to your spouse, because they're going to be gone here shortly, three times, that's some hopelessness. But you fight through, and if you fight through, you can make it through. Whatever you're going through this morning, you can make it through if you'll work on your hope. Hope releases life because it gives you reasons to live. Are you hearing me? People die when there's no more reason to live. And hope will give you reason to live. Pastor Denise and I, we've sold our home and we'll be moving into a new place in a 55 plus community. And it's not to retire. We're reducing maintenance and we don't want to hide in maintenance from hope. Are you hearing me? And we don't want maintenance to distract us from significance and what God wants us to accomplish from our purpose. We want to fulfill our God-ordained purpose, and as you get older, you realize how limited your time is, and, and you're determined to invest it in things that matter the most to you, and that's what we've decided. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his blessed mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, 
who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last day. So where does their hope come from? Their hope does not come from the circumstances. Our hope comes from, hey, the resurrection power of God. If God can raise up Jesus, look at somebody and tell them, you're next. Have hope. We're reborn with a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that, that's the major covenant difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. In the Old Covenant, God made a barren man and woman conceive, but in the New Covenant, God raised a person, a dead person, back alive. Amazing. Greater reason for hope. You see, we need hope because without hope, we can't draw near to God. What do you mean, Pastor? When we lose our hope, we start getting away from God. We get mad at God. God, why did you let this happen? Or why didn't you stop it? Backslid Christians are those who have lost hope. It's really not as much about sin and darkness. It's about the lack of light and seeing opportunities in the light. Hopeless Peter went back to fishing in his old crude ways after he had denied Christ. That's what we do. When we lose hope, we go back to whatever we distracted us before. But the resurrected Christ came looking for him, and he came to restore his lost hope. And then Peter became a whole different person. His hope was greater when it was restored than it ever was before it was lost. You say, well, I failed God, I've lost hope. No, your hope can be greater because a resurrected hope is a God-inspired hope where the other hope might have just been yours. The greatest builder of hope isn't just from the birth of Christ, but from the resurrection of Christ. And if the dead can come about, uh, alive, nothing is impossible. Can you say that? Nothing is impossible. You see, hopeless Christians cannot live holy in obedient lives. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13, it says, And he who, is, who will harm you if you become followers of what is good. Who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. Do not be afraid of their threats and, or be troubled, but sanctify the Lord in your heart and always be ready to give a defense. And it goes on to talk about hope. You see, we can't live right if we don't have hope of living right. Are you following me? There's a lot of Christians, they've given up hope on living right. They think that they just have to live in the way they're living right now, that they just can't do any better. And I want you to know there's hope in Christ. If Christ is in you, why can't you do things you couldn't do before? The revelation of Christ in you gives you hope for living in ways that you could otherwise never live. Loose living Christians are really Christians with waning hope. The major difference between the Old and New Covenant is hope. Hope. Hope didn't come from the law or the letter of the law. Hope came from a, a, a person that was born supernaturally and then died and God raised him from the dead supernaturally. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of the weakness and unprofitableness, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing of a better hope. Can you say better hope? through which we draw near to God. Where did that better hope come from? It came from the resurrection. That's where it came from. If you love God, you can't be hopeless. Because love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and as a result endures all things. See, if you don't do something about your hope, you're going to lose your love. Are you hearing me? Because love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. No hope, no love. That's why we draw away from God when we're hopeless. Look out, Christian. Hope is about, it's an important thing because it keeps you in love with God. Wow. And hopelessness makes you angry at God. And lively hope makes you love God. Living hope. Living hope makes you to continue to love God. You see, restoring hope, according to Romans 4.13, brings joy and peace as well as the power of the Holy Spirit. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And you never have faith until you first have hope. 
Hope is rejoicing in the unseen. Praying in an unknown language by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know why that's so powerful, praying in tongues? I'm going to tell you exactly why. Because it builds up your faith. Why does it build up your faith? Because when you're praying in tongues, you know God is with you. And if God is with you, if God be with me, who can be against me? For we are saved in this hope. But hope that is not seen is not hope. Hope that is seen is not hope. For what does one still hope for? What he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly await with perseverance. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are the law, but those who are the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who he believed. God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope is in hope believed so that he became the father of many nations. According to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old in the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced. That's what hope is. It's being fully convinced. That he, would, what he had promised he would be able to perform. I want you to understand something here. Abraham's faith was not in his faith. Abraham's faith was in God's faith. He believed in hope against hope. What does that mean? That means when your hope is not strong enough, human hope is not strong enough to do things that only God can do, then your hope has got to have a contest with God's hope, just like, Ab just like there was a, a wrestling between Jacob and, 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 and the angel, or some people think it was Jesus, and he's wrestling with him, and he won't, he says, I'm not going to quit until you bless me. And there are some of us here, we don't realize it, but hope will, ke will keep you struggling. It'll keep you resisting. It'll keep you enduring until you get what God wants you to have, and you'll learn to fight the good fight of faith because you're expecting something to happen. Something's going to happen that's going to change that person in that relationship. Something's going to happen that's going to change that marriage. Something's going to happen that's going going to change our financial situation. Something is going to happen that's going to bring that lost prodigal back home. Something's going to happen this Christmas that didn't happen last Christmas. Something's going to happen. Well, how do you know something's going to happen? Because I have hope in God's hope. I don't have hope just in my physical human hope. I have hope. You know, in Mark eleven twenty three, 23, it says, have faith in God. And it goes on to talk, if you have faith, you can move mountains. But do you know what that is rendered in the Greek? Have faith in the faith God has in you. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. And that's what that having hope against hope, that's what that's talking about in the Scripture. It's when your hope is not enough. If you'll come against his hope, then his hope becomes your hope. And if you can hope, it, it can happen. Have you given up your hope? I'd like us to just bow our heads. Maybe there's some of us here that we're beginning to realize that, you know, the problem really isn't my behavior. It's, it's my hope. The problem isn't really that I'm backslid. It's that I'm hopeless. And God has mercy on me. But the first thing I have to do is I have to be willing to admit that I've lost hope. And then I have to be willing to look to God for his hope, contend with God. See, if you don't, you're going to give up on God. You're going to give up on your hopes and dreams. You're going to give up on living right. You're going to give up on God-given purpose for living. And I'm going to ask you to prayerfully consider. Has some hopelessness got in there? Has your hope diminished? If that's you today and you'd be honest, you say, Pastor, I've been going through some hopeless times. Pray for me. If that's you, would you just slip up your hand, Pastor? Pray for me. Many, many hands going up here. I'm going to ask you if you raise your hand, if you just stand to your feet. Make a stand against hopelessness. Don't be passive about it. Hey, we all have hopeless times. I mean, maybe you've never been hopeless and you're better than the rest of us, but the rest of us have. And if you haven't, don't worry. It'll, 
catch up with you sooner or later. But God, he's the restorer of hope. He is hope to the hopeless. And I want to ask you to come right down here because hope comes from the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit. And I want to pray over you for a hope injection, an impartation that only God can give. You're not going to get it from positive thinking. You're not going to get it from just revving yourself up. You're going to get the power from the one who raised Christ from the dead. He's going to give you hope. Can you just lift your hands up to the Lord and surrender that hopelessness and just pray this prayer with me? Heavenly Father, I surrender my hopelessness. I surrender my depression and my discouragement and my frustration and my anger. And I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And I take my hope and I place it in your hand. And I take your hope into my hands. And I accept your hope today. I accept your faith in me. Where I haven't had any of my own.